So this is a conversation between Deirdre and I, and also we're going to take lots of questions. Um, I'd like to thank Deirdre <laughs> for agreeing to do this, or even suggesting it, actually. Um, it's the first time that anyone, any trans person with a even mod, I don't know, with some disagreements with me, <laughs> I assume, um, has ever uh, sat on a platform with me, uh, even though I've tried many times. So that's a pretty amazing thing. And I also want to thank um, the organizers here for facilitating this. So um, I ha I'm engaged in a dis public discussion about sex and gender. Um, at the moment in Anglo-American culture, there is a profound disagreement about what it is to be uh, a female, a male, a woman, a man, um, and so on. And that's a philosophical disagreement, as far as I'm concerned. I am a philosopher. Appealing to biology can't settle on its own because the meaning of biology is being dis disputed and the importance of biology is being disputed. Um, but it's also a disagreement with profoundly practical consequences. It's not just an abstract debate, even though I'm often criticised as, as if it was, because it has profoundly practical consequences for how we organise social space, how we organise sports teams, how we organise prisons, how we organise changing rooms, and so on. And also sexual relationships, since most of us have some kind of orientation towards what we think of as men and women, and so changing that might change other things too. So all of the traditional standard things that you were taught as a child, I assume, about men and women pretty simply are being challenged in popular culture, particularly on the left at the moment. Um, and not just challenged in a normal, rational way, but in a way in which it's become taboo to say certain things. And if you do say them like I say them, then you face social consequences. And in my case, I faced quite severe ones and I could no longer stay in my job because some people really didn't want me to say the things that I say. Um, and my uh, opponents, as it were, I think of as trans activists. I don't think of my opponents as trans people. Um, I think of them as a set of activists who claim to be acting on behalf of the interests of trans people. They're not all trans people themselves, and not all trans people are trans activists. So I just want to make that distinction. But trans activism has moved away, as I say, from the standard understandings of biological sex, womanhood, manhood, and what it means to be trans. So that has changed too. They now urge us to treat biological sex as either something to be ignored as completely irrelevant in every possible situation and not to be mentioned, or to be denied as non-existent anyway. So we hear it's a spectrum, sex is a spectrum, it's not binary. Uh, or even it's arbitrary, it's assign as something that's assigned at birth rather than discovered at birth by doctors. <laughs> um, so that's a, that's a shift in uh, thinking. <laughs> um, trans activism also wants us to treat womanhood and manhood as not dependent on sex or even on gender reassignment in the old sense of surgery and hormones, but as on an inner state, an inner psychological identity, if you feel like a woman and you self-identify as a woman, then you are a woman. And so first of all, you're a trans woman, and then trans women are women, so you're a woman. <laughs> so you get quite a quick route from I feel like a woman to I'm a trans woman to I'm a woman. And you don't have to have modified your body in any way according to this new position. And it's really important to realise that because I think people don't. Same goes for men. Like if a woman, if a female, well, what used to be called a female, wants to identify as a man, they're a trans man, and if they're a trans man, they're a man. And that's what, in, in Britain, we are being told must be accepted and must be affirmed, whether it's a child that thinks that or an adult that thinks that. So that's all a big shift, and I don't agree with any of it. <laughs> so I um, have a book that I've tried to defend uh, the reasons that we're, why I don't agree with that. But why do I care? I just wanted to say a couple of things about why I care. It's because of the implications when it gets enacted in policy and law, as it is being enacted in policy and law in Britain, in Spain, in Germany, in Canada, in New Zealand, and it's coming to America too, through Biden and, um, as I understand it, changes to Title IX. So um, in Britain, as opposed to what I understand that goes on in the States, uh, we have 
strong national legal protections for trans people already, which I am very happy to see, and I don't have any problem with them. You can't be fired for being trans, you can't be discriminated against for being trans, um, and it's a quite a w wide conception of what trans would be, but the pressure on the law from trans activists who have a lot of power in the UK is to change that in favour of this inner identity state. So what should be protected is the inner identity and anyone who feels like a woman should be able to be in the sports team of a woman or be in the changing room of a woman or <laughs> wherever they want to go as a woman. A prison, I mean, there's, so now we have males in women's prisons in, in Britain and in California as it happens who have not had surgery, who have not had anything and they are convicted of sex crimes against women and they're in women's prisons with women. And in some cases, they're sexually assaulting women. So it has implications. And those are the ones that I'm worried about. I'm also worried about the effect on lesbians, because I am a lesbian. And along with this new idea is the idea that if you're a trans woman attracted to women, you must be a lesbian. Uh, even if you've got a penis, <laughs> you can be a lesbian with a penis. And that's a big shift for lesbians, because <laughs> we were not supposed to be attracted to people with penises. <laughs> and now the people with penises are lesbians too. I mean, I, I appreciate that some of this sounds absolutely bonkers if you haven't heard it before, but I'm afraid it is the sort of uh, structure of things that get said to me quite often by people you think would know better. And then finally, I just want to say, the third category of people I'm really worried about is children. Um, because children, unlike adults, are getting medicated. If they have any kind of gender disturbance, quite often they're not getting the right sorts of uh, therapy about it before they take irrevocable steps. There's things called puberty blockers which can arrest their puberty. And then there's surgery very early. And in the States, it's very early potentially. So 14 year olds, 15 year olds losing body organs um, through surgery that they will never get back. Before they've really resolved whether they're gay, whether they're autistic, whether they suffer a history of trauma, there's various reasons why they might feel that they have some kind of gender identity disturbance, and that needs to be sorted out before anything else. But we don't exist in a climate where we can talk about that <laughs> without being called transphobic, and that is my experience. So that's my opening position, <laughs> and that's where I am. Well, I, you know, uh, about a month ago, the, uh, the BBC proposed to both of us to have a conversation like this. And a couple of days after they had spoken to me about it, and, and I said, well, I, I agree with K Kathleen on lots of things. They called me back and said, well, we're going to get someone else because we want someone who will be more uh, oppositional to her. And they found someone. <laughs> oh, is that so? They, yeah. I, 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 I didn't know how it turned out. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm opposed to some of the things you say. I'm, 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 I'm a trans woman in the current vocabulary. I'd, I'd prefer just to be called a woman, but that's okay. I don't mind too much. As long as those uh, ordinary rights are honored um, to employment and as lo long as people are uh, courteous and treat me as they would treat their, their grandmother, that's, uh, fi that's fine with me. I mean, I'm called ma'am. There was a time in my transition, which I talk about in my book here, Crossing, which was composed first in 1999, published by the University of Chicago Press, and then um, was uh, re uh, uh, printed with an afterword in 19, I mean in 2019, when I didn't pass, I think I pass now, but of course I have secondary male sexual characteristics. I'm tall. I had a beard, which by the way was uh, excised here in Dallas with electrolysis. Um, and I have a male voice because of, I have a large male uh, um, voice and that doesn't change with hormones. Um, there was a time when I didn't pass and that was very uncomfortable because although I'm 
perfectly prepared to have people who want to be intersexed and want to be seen as a man in a dress or, a, or whatever. If that's what they want to do, that's, uh, it's a free country they should be allowed to. But I don't want to. I want to be viewed as a, as a woman. Now, there are lots of issues here. One is a deep philosophical issue that you and I could talk a lot about, about realism and, 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 and nominalism. Whether or not, not, whether or not things exist in the world, there are rocks in the world. They sit there and they're rocks, and I don't have any disagreement with them being rocks. But what they are to us depends on their use, obviously. You can use a rock as a weapon. You can use it to put a border on the garden path. You can use it as a sculpture. You can use it as, you can think of it as a ge geological object and finding out about the earlier world, etc., etc., etc. So that there are things in the world is not decisive. That every cell in my body says X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. I, little, I wish the bastards would stop saying it. It's so irritating. They, they say X, Y, X, Y, X, Y all the time. Because na natural born females have XX genes and I have XY genes. Maybe in some future amazing biological world, you'll be able to change your genes to the opposite, but I, I don't know. Um, so, as lo long as I can be in the world uh, as a woman. Now, look, I'm not a woman. I haven't had, I haven't, you've had uh, children, you, you, uh, you, you grew up as a girl. I didn't um, and can't. But, of course, that's true of lots of our identities. One's not born as a lawyer, thank God. Um, uh, <laughs> you, you have to become one, um, and you can, you can change from being a lawyer to being a, uh, in, in business or being an ice cream salesman or whatever. Um, and, and so, so, so social roles are somewhat flexible and in a free society should be. I think there's an issue here and I think uh, Ka 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 Kathleen and I probably agree, in fact I'm almost sure we do, that in a free society people should be allowed to do lots of things that in the tr the traditional societies they're not allowed to do. Yeah. That's the great liberal change from the 18th century on that uh, she, she and I had, had, had admire so much. Now, on the, on the particular worries, oh, by the way, it's worth pointing out that in Britain, the, the, um, the, the violence in the politics comes from the left in lots of ways. Um, the, 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 the trans activists, as you say, are, think of themselves as left-wing, yeah, yeah, totally. certainly. And the TERFs, the trans-exclusionary radical feminists, also think of themselves. Well, that as depends. Left -wing. That depends. Well, and also the word TERF is a bit contested itself. I, yeah. Well, sure, sure it is. It's a it's a term of insult. Um, but in any case, there are look in the Michigan Women's Music Festival, big dikes would go around inspecting people's genitals and throwing out people who didn't have satisfactory female uh, um, uh, 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 um, plumbing. And that went on for a long time. But, but in, in, in Britain, it's mainly the left that's angry about this. And then the sort of colonel blimps in the columns of the Times agree with it. But in the United States, as you know, it's the other way around. It's now the, the, the Trumpian GOP is using trans issues as a, as a culture war issue to go after the Democrats. In this state, 
they're trying to make it illegal, uh, in fact, punishable, to allow your child to transition. Now, on, on some of the anxieties that you express, Kathleen, um, le, 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 let's take a fairly easy one, the sports issue. I kind of agree with you. Um, I, per, and especially I agree with you if, if the person in question transitioned um, post-secondary male sexual characteristics. I mean, it's just unfair that someone who has big male muscles competes against events against XX people. Um, but now there is a trouble there. Uh, there are tennis players. Uh, what's their names? The two sisters? Serena and Venus? Yeah. Have you, have you looked at them recently? Well, I know. Got, yeah. They've got big muscles. Yeah, but there's... I mean, that's I, I, not can, because I can cite statistics that say that they would lose against very low tier, ranked tiers. I know, I know, but players. they. But on the other hand, they, they they didn't cheat to get those muscles. I gather. I don't think they took male hormones or something to get more muscles. So th there's there's a little bit of a slippery slope of having to kind of what do you say handicap women mm. with larger <laughs> muscles if that's the issue. You, you can, you can... I disagree. <laughs> okay, maybe you disagree. I'll come back. But I, I don't, I don't, it, it's, it's, there's this deep philosophical issue, but then now we're talking about these policy issues. So far as children are concerned, I transitioned when I was 53. Um, yeah, okay. A couple of points. It's not irreversible. If it was not irreversible, I couldn't have transitioned at 53. I may, you know, do you believe in infant baptism? Believe in it, I've seen it. <laughs> do you believe in reversing your, uh, your, your uh, secondary sexual or female uh, uh, characteristics? I've, I've done that to some degree. And then, as far as the children are concerned, if some girl says from the age of two on, as some do, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I won't wear, won't wear dresses. How soon am I going to grow a penis? I'm a boy, I'm a boy, I'm a boy. And keep saying it. Then I don't think there's any controversy about having him um, uh, not develop se se secondary female sexual characteristics, but to start right off at, I don't know, nine or ten. There is some controversy. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know it's a controversy. I, I, I'm not... These are controversies, yeah. but I'm saying you're wrong and I'm right. Yeah, fine. I'm, that's I'm, fine. I'm that's saying, fine. I, I'm that's what I'm saying too. <laughs> I'm saying that I'm. Yeah, that's right. But I'm. I, I'm. I, I, I'm offering an argument for it, mm -hmm. which is that it's. It's a. Uh, well, I'd love if, to come back. If you don't do it, there's a high risk of suicide. That's, yeah, I know. I disagree with you on that too. I, know, I can. I can come back on this in a but minute. But wait a second. You say that the facts say that's not so. Yeah. I say your, your facts about people sneaking around in ch changing rooms to r rape females is also a fairy tale. Well, shall we talk about evidence then? Well, it, it's a little hard to talk about No, evidence. it isn't. I've got some. <laughs> well, I do too, dear. Okay, I, I well, let's have, let's have I it. I have evidence too, and, and we, we have, but look, it's not slam bang evidence, it's evaluation. It's how we interpret it. Right. It's what we're prepared to do. Correct. To let people be who they want to be. Well, I'd like to come back on a few of those points, if that's okay. Um, just to start with the children thing. Um, on the suicide um, myth, <laughs> uh, so being a trans-identified, I would say trans-identified child. I would never say trans-child, because I think that kind of solidifies this narrative too early. Um, but there are children who identify as trans. Um, and, and at an adolescent level, there's some evidence that it raises your suicide risk by about five times. And that's looking at evidence from the Gender Identity Service, the Tavistock, the National Health Service, um, Gender Identity Service in Britain, in which we've, they've seen, a, in the last 10 years, a 5,000% spike in girls identifying as boys, and about, I think a 2,000% something uh, spike in boys identifying as girls. 
So there's something going on because it's, the numbers have gone right up recently. Um, and so somebody's crunched that data. Now, to put that in context, being anorexic raises your suicide risk much higher than that. Um, being depressive, obviously, so there can be comorbidity, there can be several factors, and there often is in trans-identified childs. They also suffer from anorexia, the girls, some of them, they also suffer from autism. Um, so unpicking all that is important, and it, nobody's denying that the mental health of trans-identified children is very important. In fact, that's exactly my point. But you can see on the Tavistock website, and that's a very trans-friendly place, they say the risk of suicide is low. So the trouble is that transactivism has taken this narrative about suicide and used it to frighten parents into affirming too soon their children. And I'm afraid that's, I think there's overwhelming evidence for that point. Now the other thing I just want to say about this two-year-old child that says I'm a boy, I'm a boy, when am I going to grow a penis? How could that child possibly know at that stage what those concepts mean? I mean, my children took till they were at least three or four to be reliably able to identify he's from she's. Um, they, they may be, if you're autistic, you have a delayed, quite often, categorical um, perception and you can be quite rigid and black and white about things. So there's a number of reasons that they might have a very superficial idea of what a girl was. They might even think, and, and I've talked to gender therapists at the Tavistock who say this, they might even think that if you've got short hair, you're a boy. They might think if you've got long hair, you're a girl. <laughs> so, and if you look at some of the, if the DSM, which is the standard kind of manual for psychiatric disorders, if you look at the um, child gender dysphoria, they say things like, does the child want to play with boys' toys? Well, maybe they're a boy. You know, so in a way, it sounds quite reactionary to me and quite anti-progressive because it seems to be suggesting if you are a girl that likes boys' toys, maybe you're a boy. Why can't we just have girls that like boys' toys? that fancy girls <laughs> that break all the gender stereotypes that we have been fighting for. So I'm very alarmed at the idea of a two-year-old that's being told that they must be a boy. I think that's almost criminal, to be honest. But on the matter of prevalence, consider the possibility that we're, um, we're allowing people to change, whereas before we didn't. And, and, you know, look, when I transitioned, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders classified me as nuts. And this is 1995. And um, uh, it, it said that it was in one in 20,000 births. Now, as you well know, that is radically wrong that it's more well, like these days it definitely is yeah. one in 400 or one in one in much more common and uh when when you have situations like in holland uh which which was fairly early in allowing people to do the to do the plumbing operation and so forth uh um the the numbers went up of course they did it's it's rather look. You can take the view about homosexuality that in Northern Europe for about a hundred years, male homosexuality was criminalized. It was not true in the in, in the south of Europe, and then it was released. And now, as you as we know, there are gay groups in high schools. Mm -hmm. And the football team has stopped abusing them, mostly. So, you know, t to let the lid off doesn't necessarily mean that it's false. True, true. And I, I think you'll, you, 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 you'll agree with that. So I agree with that. I think there, there must be a social contagion element, but um, that well, to be decided. Yeah, there's social contagion element. Yeah, that's right. Should they, we? Do you think we should? Because I'm aware we've only got. An hour? Absolutely. Right? Well, so maybe we should it, move so. to some questions? Yeah, we've got some. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, Deirdre, I have one for you. And this, I've really enjoyed our conversations this week. I respect the shit out of you for, for doing this. Um, but I have something that it's always kind of, so, so that's all to say, by the way, that this is not like a you know personal thing. But my, my, my conception of gender has always been that 
you know, there are things that are typically feminine and typically masculine. And, you know, um, as Kathleen was kind of saying, you can be a girl who likes boys' toys or vice versa. And to me, obviously, as somebody who's never gone through this inner struggle, I don't understand what it would be that makes you feel not like a feminine man, but like a woman specifically. Well, uh, the, yeah, and, and of course there are, there are o- overlaps in hair hair length and <laughs> strength even, and how fast you run and so forth. Between and then certainly in interests, um, I know women who are sports fanatics, and I know men who English men who don't like cricket. I, I can't understand it, but but and by the way, understanding is not the issue. It's not a theorem. If I say, I like vanilla ice cream, I don't, I think we all agree that it would be kind of crazy for someone to say, why do you like vanilla ice cream? What is this? What's this vanilla ice cream obsession you have? Right? But the, the, so I, I, my, in fact, my, my, my wife, my wife of 30 years, the lo- love of my life, she asked me this too. She said, well, why don't you just dress in a more frilly fashion? But when I was Donald, I was a guy. And I actually was. I was actually viewed as kind of a macho fellow. Like my mother, I'm a somewhat macho uh, woman for that matter. But if you knew my mom, you'd know where I got that. But e- in any case... I, I don't want to be. I want to be a woman. I want to be treated as 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 a woman, and I don't see what the problem is. And I don't think uh, Kathleen does either on this point. Um, if I want to be seen as a lawyer, I go to law school in some societies, or I, I apprentice with a lawyer, and then people start calling me a lawyer. I pass the bar exam. I I mean I'll just quickly say my perspective on the last bit. I'm afraid there is a difference between us on that, in that I don't see woman, womanhood as being like lawyerhood. Um, I think it's, uh, the, um, for reasons that we definitely don't have time to go into, but you can, uh, you can read my book, it's on Kindle, it's very cheap. Um, <laughs> I'm not trying to get it, it's just quicker than to go into it. I think womanhood, the best possible account of womanhood is adult human femalehood. However, I also have a chapter in my book where I say that I think I'm, and this, this won't satisfy you, and it just satisfies very few, but I think the best that I can say is that we can immerse ourselves in a fiction of, of womanhood, and, and that's perfectly appropriate in some contexts, and it would be disrespectful not to, and we should observe preferred pronouns, um, but I don't think it's literally true, I'm afraid. Observe. I just want to observe, because the, I saw that phrase of yours, which I think is a very interesting one, immersive fiction. Mm-hmm. And my view is that life is an immersive fiction. Right. So I guess if that would figure, because if you thought all of this was fiction, including lawyerhood, presumably, I think, <laughs> I think that would change. I think things. psychological and social life right. is an immersive fiction. Whereas I would say there's some realism and then there's the fiction. You're, you think there's something called a rock and it's just a rock. I do. I, think I understand that. And so we have a deep philosophical, di- in our epistem, to be more precise, ep- epistemological di- yeah. difference here. That doesn't make Kathleen a bad person. She's a good person. But it makes her naive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can just say, do I have to use the microphone? Oh, okay. Um, what do you both think it means to be a woman? Well, my, you see, I think the simplest and not only is it the oldest, because in every natural language there's been a distinction between the adult human females and the adult human males, and it's a very good distinction because we needed it for sexual reproduction and other things. I think it's the best. I mean, every time somebody tries to build a social conception of womanhood, they get sexist stereotypes in there, as far as I can see. So why not just have the women and the men, and then the women and the men can be feminine or masculine or whatever whatever they want. Um, That's what makes sense to me. Well, I, 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 I'd, I'd say that it's a social construction, so there, there we are with our epistemological problem. But it, um, let's see, what else, what is a woman? 
I didn't believe I was a woman. I'm not crazy. I, I, I didn't, you know, say, oh, there's a kind of journalistic shorthand that misleads a lot of people, not, not Kathleen is, who's sophisticated about this, but the, the journalistic fiction is you're a woman trapped in a man's body. And that's a nice, simple way of talking about it, but it's not true. When I was a guy, as I said before, I felt like a guy. <laughs> I took 15 minutes to buy clothing. That's one test. I take 15 minutes to buy clothing, too, <laughs> as you can probably tell. Now you do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a man. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Um, I was wondering how your, both, for both of you, how your views on trans people account for uh, detransitioners who cha may change their minds. It's very, very rare, and if it happens, it's easily changed. Look, no, 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 no. Come on, come on. <laughs> I'm a, as I said before, I, I'm, I'm a living example. You mustn't. The Reddit detransition, uh, whatever it is, has like 10,000 people on it. And it's what you'd expect if you'd seen social contagion. The numbers have gone up 5,000% in the last 10 years. They're not all staying in there. And what we are seeing, and you will have to believe me, <laughs> because I can provide you multiple links, is um, people coming out at the age of 25. Um, having transitioned socially or medically in adolescence uh, who really regret it and some of them have no genitals look, <laughs> some of them have had okay. double mastectomies or okay, okay, they have had okay, lost their okay, okay, ovaries okay, okay. or they have lost their wombs it's important yeah. I have to say that is an important yeah, yeah, fact sure to it's say it hardly ever happens but look, not but, look, but look dear many decisions we make and that parents make are irreversible <laughs> are irreversible if you have a household with your children where there aren't books and you don't read your children, then they'll not have a, 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 a very, usually, they'll not have a very successful academic they've life. they've lost their penises. What? They've lost their penises, some of them. They've so lost I know their they've ovaries. lost their penises, that, whereas but the people who didn't it. have books have lo lo lost, the, lost the life of the mind. I mean, th <laughs> things... Things are irreversible. Lots of things are irreversible in life. Okay, well, we differ on our if you, priorities. If, if you drive carelessly, you'll, have, you'll, you'll fall, you'll, you'll have, have brain damage, and that's irreversible. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know... But these children were told that they could change sex, and that is the difference. The adults around them told them that they, they, was, they should be affirmed, that there would be no complications, that they, they, this is a permanent state that they were in, that they had discovered their true nature. Yeah, yeah. And we, that's the narrative that I disagree well, with. It's not necessarily fixed, especially early on in your life. It might be fixed for some, I, but it's certainly not fixed for I them. know lots of trans people, and I've never encountered anyone who isn't other than ecstatic about changing gender now that you, you, may have, uh, you, you may have other sources, but if this, to the very, this is what the, what the TERFs say, they say, trans-exclusionary radical feminists, they say, oh, people will, will regret it. Well, most of them don't. Let's, let's at least agree on that. Well, and it depends on the age demographic. If you transition age 50, your prefrontal cortex is grown in. You may have had a long time to think about it. If you transition when you're 15 and you have surgic, surgic, your breast surgery removed, I would say it's quite obvious, understanding developmental psychology, that there's a higher chance you will regret it because you don't know what you're doing. There's tattoo regret in, in adolescence, so why wouldn't there be regret like that? So, okay, so I, I think maybe we know different demographics. So, I certainly so, know so, a lot of So what you want to do... Uh -huh. oh, actually, there, there is one issue that I think we might agree on, for sure. I think there, 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 there are a lot of things we agree on, understanding, on this matter. But one I would like to ask you, do you think the, do you think the state should be involved? In which? In, in any of this. I should think... the government be involved? Well, uh... and, and if so, why? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not a libertarian, so we're probably well, going I don't to disagree on that. But I think, so for instance, at the moment, the National Health Service in Britain is doing a big review of gender identity medicine for children because uh -huh. they are, and they've already put out an interim report, which everyone can read online. They've reviewed all the literature, uh -huh. the puberty blocker stuff, and they have concluded that there's a very poor evidence base so far 
for what is going on here. The Dutch protocol that was introduced in Holland, that introduced pu puberty blockers, has been, they have changed their minds. Sweden, the Karolinska Institute, which has been, they, they no longer give puberty blockers. The Karolinska Institute in Sweden, which has been the forefront of pushing puberty blockers onto children for a long time, has now referred itself to a regulatory body. body. So there is an emerging amounts of evidence, which everyone should look into if you're interested, um, that there are big problems in this area and it hasn't been well evidenced. But so should the state the should, the state should um, it, instruct some kind of regulatory body in medicine. I see. To, that's one example. So you're in favor of the state intervening in these matters? In short. I, if I'm in favor of some adults in the room intervening, and if that's the form of the state, then yes. I mean, it depends I which state. Is Iran? No, because Iran tends to use uh, transition far too freely. But at the moment in Britain, there's some evidence that sense is returning, I think, uh -huh. through okay. the well, government. You, there, there we do sharply disagree. I don't think the state should have any, any role in this period. Okay. Um, thank you. I, th I wanted to come back to some things, uh, Kathleen, that you said at the beginning that really resonate with me because, and Deirdre, I wonder what you think about this, is that it feels like the ambivalence about defining a woman is indicative of this, if you don't know what it is anymore, you don't really know when it can't be, how it can be preserved. And I think about things like sports, like the reason women's sports exist have to do with the fact that half of the population have bodies that will only ever develop to a certain degree and that they will, they will function competitively in a certain way, not because anyone decided that they should be that way, but because persons only instantiate as male or female when they're born. And so you see this as a protection for the way that will always be. And the similarly, like with changing spaces or with prisons and all of those, when the state steps in, it's because that's for the sake of like how it's, mat it's materially realized in the body and it has certain consequences because of that. And I guess what I feel like is all of this, when we can't define a woman or when women be call become called pregnant persons or um, like vulva bearers or like other like to me that are that like really hurts because it feels like you're kind of evaporating or something or like what 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 do you yeah I guess it becomes harder to talk about how that's preserved or what the state stepped in to preserve all of those things and it feels like a diminishment of it and I just really want to know what, how you feel like a, this is still protected I I don't see why the state should be involved on that either but but look on a sort of common sense basis, I, I think these matters that people bring up are not big sports and changing rooms. If you want to discriminate against me and forbid me to go into bathrooms or changing rooms, okay, go ahead, that's fine. I don't mind that much. If you want to um, stop me from playing women's sports, I, I, I actually kind of think you're right. But w I don't see why it should be the government that does it. I, I, I can understand why the NCAA or something might say, okay, look, we're, we're going to do this. But why the government? Because the danger is, of course, that you get Texas <laughs> and you get the government intervening in this violent way um, in, in uh, well, as it did in homose male homosexuality. So can I ask a question? How would you feel about... Um so, for me, the ideal would be to legally protect sex, as traditionally understood, and females in certain spaces and sports and all the rest of it, and then legally protect gender reassignment, but not to kind of define gender reassignment as changing sex, because it's when you start saying it's changing sex that you start mixing up the two protected characteristics and people well, get I, I confused. Agree. Look, look I, I, but, I always talk about XX and XY. Yeah, you're very unusual, actually, because it's... I mean, in my experience of talking to trans activists, if they'll ever talk to me, they would say half the things you said was transphobic. Well, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not, you're not supposed to even mention XY chromosomes anymore, you know, or anything. I don't know, I don't know why they don't understand biology. It's very simple. Yeah, they don't. Well, they don't, but, they, but, they, but by they don't the way, think it exists. But by the way, that doesn't, as you said yourself, that doesn't settle it. Because by, incidentally, there are intersex people. Yeah. There are people XXY. But, and XYY and so forth. So how do we treat them? Well, 
that's a different question. And those two things are politically shoved together and poor intersex people are being instrumentalized and put into pride flags and all sorts, but they are born. Um, there's a very small number of people born yeah. with a genital ambiguity um, and they deserve respect and not to be instrumentalized and they have their own medical issues that we need but to think know. about. But that's got nothing to do with trans because the, just like every other part of the population, 99.88 or something percent of the population are not intersex. I would like to bring in a somewhat sharp and dangerous comparison, which is that... Uh, for a long time, there, it's got a rather odd history. People with uh, people with black skin were treated as God made you this way, and look, your skin is black, so we should treat you in such and such a way. And the next, and so well, and 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 there were around it around the black skin problem, <laughs> I think it's a white skin problem, but anyway, around the black skin problem, uh, um, ca came all kinds of uh, myths about uh, all kinds of attempts to, as you know, scientific racism 100 years ago was I, I understand standard. all of this, and I it was abhor it, but I'm just wondering. I know you abhor it, and I do too. And it, it, it was, it was, it, it had the same emotional valence, it seems to me, as this does now. And, and the attitude towards home, home, male, especially male homosexuals. There, there was, people didn't ever wor worry too much about, about l l lesbians. Had this same heat, the same appeal to naturalness. And I, I, I worry. I, I want us to have a free society in which people are treated as individuals, not as, as categories, um, and, uh, and are treated, as you say, with, that, with respect. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the danger of, uh, I don't know, I suppose the danger of the crazies on both sides, which does not include us, is that it'll get... Um, that, that we'll go back to a well, sort of dark age. I definitely would like to just comment on that for a second because I completely agree with you about that. And one thing I'm exceptionally worried about is this kind of increasing polarization where on the right, particularly in America, there is just increasing revulsion for the whole yeah. thing, LGBT, everything, you know, it's all yeah, degenerate. Yeah. Um, and then on the left, these increasingly extreme radical positions where you yep. are not allowed to worry about children having surgery or you're not allowed to worry about um, uh, male rapists in women's prisons. And you're not, you know, so that's a terrible situation because it's a gift to the right. You know, if the left don't start, as far as I'm concerned, confronting this properly and responsibly and talking about yeah. it uh, clearly with evidence, <laughs> Then the right will, t the far right will take advantage, and we will see militias at Pride and all the things that we are yeah. starting to see, and there'll be a backlash generally against gay people, trans yeah, people, so. and the rest. So, yeah, it's urgent that we can find a responsible middle ground, whether or not obviously yeah. we disagree on some things. But this well, is about as productive as conversation as I, I've ever had about it. So you and I <laughs> should write a book together that's responsible <laughs> middle ground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the difference between dysmorphia and dysphoria. Um, it feels like uh, we could like think of, I don't know if you if y'all would reject this framing, but we could think of transness as like a spectrum. So um, as a function of how uncomfortable, let's say you are with your body. Um, like on, on the one hand, we have like, um, uh, like fashion or kind of makeup, where it's like a slight discomfort and society basically just tells you um, you can't do that many th things about it and we're not going to acknowledge it as like a specific disorder um, or like anorexic people, right? We force them to accept their bodies um, uh, and like that's kind of, I guess, the pos body positivity movements. And then I guess on the other hand, um, people who are um, much more uh, uncomfortable with their bodies, um, we would classify that as like needing some sort of affirmation rather than like forcing society forcing them to accept it. Um, 
accept their discomfort with their bodies. So I'm wondering if, um, first, uh, where y'all think w uh, the distribution, what, what it looks like? Is it like bimodal that out here there's like trans people or like it's a large bump in the number of people that actually need affirmation to prevent suicide? And um, I'm wondering where you think the line should be between dysmorphia and dysphoria as far as like what society should force you to like come to terms with or just accept as uh, what you are or something. Well, I wasn't uncomfortable with my body as a man. I, I, you're, you're, you're looking at the captain of our high school football team. I was a lineman. So I wasn't, I was, when I was a guy, I was macho. Not macho, I don't want to exaggerate that. I was, God, I was a professor. How macho can they be? Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, was, I was a guy. And I wasn't, this, this whole idea that it's, it's um, discomfort with your body, dysphoria, I, I, I just, that doesn't correspond with my feeling or the feeling with lots of other people I've known. But uh, I, I kind of see your point. Have you got anything to well, say? Well, I mean, I, I don't have much that's helpful to say, but I just wanted to point out that lots of women are uncomfortable with their bodies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, Fewer men. And culturally, I think they're encouraged to be. Yeah. And um, right. I think that's yet another reason why we need to be very careful in working out why people think that women in particular think they're trans. Um, because I think that young people will find the tools in the culture around them to express their distress. And they used to be anorexic, but some of them still are. They used to, you know, 10 years ago in my classes, lots of students had uh, cuts all up, in that, up their arms. They don't anymore, but now they breast bind. That's and I just think, so there's ways in which you can express your self-disgust that aren't necessarily a sign that this is a permanent state. <laughs> that, by the way, dear, has the ring of truth for me. Right. And I, I, I find it, I'm not completely convinced, but I, I, that sounds right to me, that girls would ha have this more, this kind of, oh, you know, these damn breasts and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah I think so. Uh, do you believe there should be a minimum age requirement for hormonal therapy and gender, gender reassignment surgery, and who should enforce it? Well, I think it's fairly clear that okay, okay, Kathleen and I don't agree on this. I, I would say that, that um, when, when puberty sets on, it just starts, then you should have hormone therapy. Well, whenever it does, it gets earlier and earlier, by the way, because of the health of modern children, the nutrition of modern children. Um, the onset of menstruation in girls in the, in, the, in the 19th century was as late as 18, and now it's a lot earlier. But okay, um, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I want to take a sensible middle position, and, and I, I, I agree. They're kind of psychiatric questions to be answered. And, and, but I, I think we also need a bit more evidence about what puberty blockers do to the body, which we don't really have, but there is some evidence that it causes early osteoporosis. Um, because puberty is in our systems for a reason. Like, there's a, there's a whole set of processes that get released um, once puberty sets in. And if you retard that, then obviously you stunt, you stunt growth for a start. Which is, from my point of view, I'd really love. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm quite tall too, but we're talking that, like, if, if... So what the Tavistock has discovered through looking at their data is that if you... If the, the children... So they've been running a, basically an uncontrolled experiment for the last five or six years, putting uh, children on puberty blockers. And nearly all of them went on to cross-sex hormones. But if they didn't go on to puberty blockers at the same clinic, then they didn't go on to cross-sex hormones. So there's some worry there that they're being put on a channel that before they really had a chance to know what it means, they're on this track. Mm -hmm. But when they, if they're puberty blocked, they're small. They haven't got genital development. Um, some of them never had an orgasm. I'm sorry to talk <laughs> or, <laughs> that way, but they don't, they haven't sexually developed. 
So they, they haven't had sexual contact often with people. They don't know what they're missing before they go on to the next stage. So there's all sorts of questions, both about body and mind, that really need sorted out. And I would say no puberty blockers, <laughs> I'm afraid. I would, if I was in charge, I would say no puberty blockers at all until we know what they do at least. And then I would say, if you want to have surgery, you should be the, the sort of standard majority age where you get to drink and drive and, and, and you other things like why would you be able to cut your breasts off before you can and you, and, and you think drink? that <laughs> that that the the current members of parliament or the United States Congress are, are the right people to make this decision I don't know about that I mean I, I I fear that our differences on that are not about this particular issue but more about the role of government or something like that yeah, so I just right. don't but I mean that would extend it out in a way I couldn't really. well we have the government we have uh, there's a famous remark by, what's his name, um, that uh, he would rather be governed by the first hundred people in the uh, New York telephone directory than by the United States Congress, and I kind of agree. Okay. Over here. Uh, thank you for this talk. Um, I know the effort of Texas to uh, criminalize the transition of children um, was brought up, and I have to commend this effort because, from my point of view, it is the duty of every of all parents to rein in their children from life-altering mistakes. Okay. A, a, a parent tells uh, his or her child to not drink and drive because you bet the consequences of that could be life-altering, and. I feel as though, again, I'm, I'm specifically limiting this to not adults, but children, uh -huh. pre-puberty or, you know, early teens I undergoing see. this. And this is, I know there was some debate about, up there about whether this is physical or, or irreversible or not. An, it, it and, and whether it is or not, certainly there are major social consequences for um, uh, a teenager in doing this. Yeah, I understand, um, dear. And for me, when you brought up the idea of uh, you don't think the government should be should be involved. Now, parents have the right to, um, you know, have some say over what their children are allowed to do, but uh -huh. the state will step in if a parent decides to rape his child. You bet. And it's sp specifically about this, um, and and. If a child goes through that, the, that child, you know, when he or she grows up, can be scarred for life. Yeah, so right, I'm, right. So I'm, you say. I'm, I'm struggling to find a, a moral difference between allowing a child who has not gone through puberty, who has not experienced any of uh -huh. that, and, you know, other forms of child sexual abuse. And I'm, I'm wondering what both of you would think about well, that. Well, you, you, you kind of know what my opinions are. I, 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 I think there are lots of irreversible things that people do to their children and with their children, and the children do. And uh, why people get especially excited about this one issue, I, I find puzzling. That's one point. And, and there, are, there are really irreversible decisions that... that that are made by parents that are bad, that are just terrible. I, I don't know, dietary uh, habits that they convey to their children or, or uh, 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 racial attitudes or all kinds of things that are irreversible, that are, that are actually irreversible. And then, as I've said, for most, for, at least for social purposes, you can reverse. Um, and, and then, then I, 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 I don't, I agree with you that, that, that the state has an interest in preventing parents from uh, re, for sexually uh, abusing their, their um, children. But th this I don't regard as sexual abuse. I, I regard it on the continent because it's not for the pleasure of the parents. It's for the expressed deep desire of the child. Now, again, I, I, do you really want the government to be involved like Sparta in 
the raising of children in such a thoroughgoing way. And I, I wonder that w whether you actually do. I mean, not, not that you're insincere, but have you truly considered putting the state of Texas in charge of child raising? And I, I say, watch out. Um, so I am more on your side than <laughs> Tidrick probably, but I, I'm not sure I would call it, I, I'm a bit hesitant about calling it sexual abuse. Um, I don't see, in this area, there's so much inflammatory language. Um, I don't, I think, I'm not saying it's good. <laughs> I don't think it is good, but I think that it's not, as Deirdre said, it's not motivated in the yeah. same way. And actually what I find, where I would disagree is like, you know, it's very difficult to get parents um, to change their dietary habits or whatever. You know, there's, there's various ways you mentioned in which things might be less than optimal. But it's not that difficult to get this stuff out. To get what? Dear? To get, I mean, basically, these children, I think, this is where we again disagree, many of them would not feel like this if the culture around them hadn't given them the idea. And that's the trouble that the culture around them at the moment, as opposed to 10 years ago, is giving them the idea <laughs> that they might be in the wrong body um, and they no. need to be affirmed. And that's all new. So, whereas... It, but 10 years ago or 15 years ago, a child might have said, oh, I really like, you know, a boy might have said, I really sure. want to wear a dress. And the parents might have said, cool, just put a dress on. And they might have said, I really want to be called Charlotte. Fine, call her Charlotte for a bit. Yeah, yeah. It's just play, we're just exploring, and that's fine. Sure. But these days, you might be put off to a clinic <laughs> quite quickly. Or your teachers might start affirming you and calling yeah. you trans and telling you you're trans. And before yeah. you know it, that's solidified. So it's the culture that's doing it around them, and we can fix that. <laughs> well, no, wait a second. We, we, be, be careful with what you wish for, because, as you know, there are people who believe that homosexuality is the same way, that it's a mm -hmm. choice of I lifestyle. Know. I know. And, and the society around them in, uh, in conservative areas of the United States affirms... Um, de, um, de queering of kids. I understand, but I don't. And, think and you're not in favor of wrong that. in I one area. That. It means that you can't. Are you in right favor of? Another. If you are you in favor of that? Do I look like I'm in favor of that? Well, but <laughs> do I? You know, th th that's not a very good answer. Well, do I that's, look like that's, I feel that's slightly, with due respect, that's an unfair analogy, which is constantly thrown at me as well. But I mean, obviously, I would say um, that a child coming out as gay something that should be uh, take, not necessarily taken you know children go through fluidity of sexuality all the time as well mm. but you know but the difference is there's no medical route <laughs> there's no you know there's just no so, you, so that's so, a serious so, disanalogy so what's bothering you is the is the uh, is the scalpel is that what's bothering me is the scalpel, scalpel. That, that, that's what's frightening. Uh, uh, it's not Aside frightening from that, me, it's I the same as, as uh, well. The trying puberty to blockers, the, kids. The, the, the bodily effects. Yes, I mean it, we have a different set of priorities, but it seems to me that those, and you those want are quite the state grave. to be involved. You know, I don't see why you don't want the state to be involved in uh, uh, in, in in gay kids. I, I don't get it. Oh. I don't see why it wouldn't be a, exactly the same case, except for the scalpel. Okay. We have time for one more question. Back here. Here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about what seems like a point of agreement that you had, which is that the defining feature of um, your disagreement over what, what a woman is, is realism versus nominalism. And as someone who doesn't really know much about this, I, I guess I should go read up on it. But what is your like best argument in favor of either of those Oh my God! That's well, like, what's a, like, what is an argument? Like, what is a disagreement that you think that leads you to different side of that debate? I mean, that's a disagreement about the structure of the world, uh, metaphysically, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what kinds of things are in there. What is objectivity as opposed to what that's humans right. put there? Um, that's right. So I think that there is a world that's independent of humans. Uh, yeah, that once I do humans too. died out, there would still be uh, at least some. Uh, of the things that we know now. Uh, and one of the things I think, so say that humans died out, but all the other, other animals stayed somehow, I think there'd still be biology in the world. So I think humans are in a, you know, we're biological creatures, 
we're not the only sexually dimorphic species. There's males and females across the board and also in plants as well. I mean, having large gametes, small gametes. It's, uh, so biology is something I think take to be really in the world. Um, and then on top of that, there's a lot of social stuff that humans bring that can differ from culture to culture. Um, now, I think you disagree with me about the realist level, perhaps? I'm not well, sure. I, 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 certainly, I certainly agree that there is a world and there is biology and XX exists and XY and so forth. Um, but I, I don't think that that's dispositive, as the lawyers say. I don't think it, and, and I, I don't think it ends the conversation at all, because how you then use that, like go, go back to my analogy of black skin. hundred years ago, many scientists, and they weren't so-called scientists, they were some of the most eminent scientists in, in, in the world, believed that black skin was dispositive. I don't, but they did, and it was rampant. Um, and uh, so, so I think that social, you know, I, 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 I'm an English professor, among other things, and, and or was, and I agree that some of my English professor friends are nuts. Because they say, oh, n nothing matters, it's all words, and don't worry about it. There's no such thing as rocks. But what we do with rocks, or gender, is a choice. And we've got to be careful about it. I think you and I completely agree on that. It's, that's a serious matter. Um, so so there's, there's that fundamental disagreement. Then there, there are disagreements about policy. And there, I think it turns on our attitudes towards the state. I'm very suspicious I'm sure of the state, that. and you're not so suspicious. I don't, I don't think it does turn. I think, you think the I'm National saying that Health I don't Service really, should decide this? Well, I, I want somebody to do it, some responsible body. I don't really care if it's the state or a non-governmental organization or whatever. It could okay. be just doctors. It could be the union of doctors. I don't really care. I just yeah. want people to start paying attention to the def detrimental effects of this. So I'm, I'm a yeah. bit lost in this why yeah, must how, state how, thing. How are you going to enforce this, dear? If, if people don't agree with it, should, should they be put in jail? I mean, look. They, the, yes, they, they should they, be put in jail. There That's is exactly a sharp distinction between voluntary decisions that people talk about and reasonably agree or disagree on and the exercise of state power. State power depends on violence, and and uh, I'm a bit lost. I'm a bit lost because I, I I think this is, goes back to some bigger disagreement that we must have, presumably libertarian versus I think libertarian. So. But I don't see why this would ramify down to the question of whether something should be done by some kind of authority, as opposed to just letting this crazy free for all happening where. Um, children, as far as I'm concerned, are being harmed. Women in prisons are being harmed. I mean, somebody has to decide where this prisoner goes, right? This prisoner either goes in the female prison or the male prison. Yeah. You're not just going to ro roll a dice. Yeah. So I'm talking about whichever authorities are appropriate to make these decisions should be making them. And I don't really yeah. care whether it's the government, the state, the medical association, the prison and governors association or whatever. Yeah. So that would be my position. Yeah. We very much appreciate you guys doing this. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. Thank you.